Mentors is one of uh, the best things that I get to do. Let me get rid of this here. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. So I'll start with an introduction. My name is Janelle Sharhag. I have been working with Black Bears since 2013. Uh, I mainly work with federal agencies. I've worked with the National Park Service, with APHIS, and with the Forest Service. And I'm not here tonight, though, as an employee of any agency. So I'm just here on my own. I have a bachelor's and a master's in wildlife ecology. And the master's research was specifically on non-fatal attacks by black bears and agency risk management. Um, but I'm not going to present that research tonight. I'll be using parts of it. So what am I gonna talk about? I am going to talk about what I think most people wanna know, or at least it's what I get the most questions about. And that is, what do I do? What do I do if I encounter a bear? And so there's so many things that I would love to talk about black bears about their diet, their denning, their socialization, but we're gonna get right into it. There's a lot to cover and answer that question. What do I do if I encounter a black bear? And we're gonna organize this talk by the most important thing that um, informs what we do when we encounter a bear. And that is, behavior, the bear's behavior. And we're gonna categorize those in two ways. My arrow's not working here, there we go. Defensive and non-defensive. And we'll explain all that in a bit. And I'm gonna be, we're gonna be looking to the past. So going to past research and information, we're gonna provide information about these two behaviors, examples about them, talk about common scenarios, and when we do that, it's going to serve the purpose to also uh, debunk these common myths that we have. And I, I hope a lot of people know these already, but they're these fallacies that have just kind of stuck around. And one of them is that black bears are harmless and they, they won't attack anyone. They're basically just big raccoons and you don't have to worry. And the next is that you should always fight back if a black bear attacks. And we're gonna also talk about why that's not true. But if we're not supposed to do that, then what do we do? We're gonna talk about response. Uh, so again, Kim said to, if you have questions, put them in the chat, we'll get to them in the end. And we are just gonna dive right in and start with the encounter. So you are walking along a trail and you're having a good time listening to nature and you hear this rustling in, in the bushes. It's a loud rustling. And you come around the corner and you see this beautiful bear digging in the dirt at something. You know, he's trying to get it some food. And as you come up, it stops and looks at you. So at this moment, we now have a bear encounter. So the encounter starts when the bear notices you and responds to you. So that's, that's where this all begins and then what we should do about it. Let's talk a little bit um, first about what each of these behaviors are, just a general overview. I'm you just had that first encounter and the bear noticed you and is gonna respond to you, you usually have all the information you need to tell if it's going to be defensive or if it's gonna be non-defensive. And the key to this is, and we're gonna go over this several times, so don't worry, you don't have to memorize it right now, is that when it's defensive, the bear sees you as a threat. And this is usually because it's defending its young or its food or even its mates, or you're too close. And it's usually, almost always actually, going to show you signs that it is agitated and stressed. And we're going to look at what those are. And that's going to trigger that, you know, common thing we hear, the fight or flight reaction. And we want to avoid that fight reaction. So for non-defensive, the bear does not see you as a threat. And in fact, it might want something from you. So this can be food seeking behavior. Uh, it might want the food that you have, or uh, it might want to use you as food. 
And at that point, I will bring up that, you know, clearly we're talking about some traumatic things here when animals attack people. I want to just kind of give that warning. So we're going to be talking about some uncomfortable things, but I'm not going to show any graphic images or videos. But just so you know, we are going to be talking about an attack, which is a tra traumatic event. So keep that in mind. There's also some other behaviors that are non-defensive, and it could be just that the bear is habituated, and that means a bear's used to seeing humans. So it might not run from you, it might not approach you, but it just might tolerate your presence. It could also be curious or naive. It might wanna check you out. Or it could just be, you could be in the way. It could be traveling down a trail from point A to B, and you could be in the way. We are really gonna focus though on the food seeking and the predatory, because those are the two cases where we usually see um, in uh, encounters escalate to attacks. So we've broken it down between defensive and non-defensive. We can also break it down uh, between the results of the attack, between attacks by bears that result to fatalities on humans and attacks that don't. So we, know, we actually know a lot about these um, because we can study the past. And what we know about uh, the attacks by black bears that are fatal on humans, and uh, just some numbers here, that usually is one every other year in the lower 48 and almost two a year in Canada and Alaska combined. And we know that those attacks are usually the result of a male bear acting as a predator. And we also know that non-fatal attacks are different and that there's about 12 a year in the lower 48. We don't have a good estimate for Canada and Alaska, unfortunately, but those are often the result of female bears with young reacting defensively. So in general, we know that most fatal attacks are by adult male bears acting as a predator and these bears are often in remote areas um, and non-habituated or food conditioned. But that the non-fatal attacks are by female bears with young acting defensively. Um, they are often food conditioned, which might be the reason they're close to people. Uh, and a lot of these involve dogs. Okay, so first we're going to go into defensive encounters and then we will go into non defensive encounters. So, again, we're, we're going to review. The bear sees you as a threat. It's probably defending either it's young or you're too close, and you're going to see the signs of agitation. And we want to reduce the fight response. So, what are those signs of agitation? I think the best way, um, and that also black bears are females with young involving dogs. All right, got ahead of myself here. We have one more thing to say about defensive first before we show you the agitation signs. So we, we have questions we can ask ourselves. It might seem, well, how, how do I know this? How in the situation can I possibly tell if it's reacting defensively? Well, there's pretty common themes. So we can ask ourselves, is there young present? Do you see cubs? Is there natural bear food present? Are you near a berry patch or possibly a carcass? Even though black bears aren't natural carcass defenders like brown bear are, uh, it can happen. And then do you have a dog? Did you get too close? Did you startle the bear? And then is it showing those warning signs, those signs of agitation? So now we're gonna look at an example of that. And this is kind of a quiet video. So I'd like you all to turn your volume up because I wanna make sure you hear it. So I'm gonna make sure mine's up and listen for these signs of agitation. They're gonna be huffing, moaning, jaw popping, and huffing. Okay, so did you hear that? 
that popping. There was a little bit of a moan. Um, and other things that black bears do are also salivating. You actually might see saliva dripping from the mouth or slapping. The bear will slap the ground. And so these are really common and they're really common mainly in defensive encounters. Another thing that's common is, I'm sure you've all heard of a bluff charge. So I think people tend to think of a bluff charge as something really scary, maybe where the bear is growling and standing up and really trying to scare you, but it can actually be a little more subtle. And so I've got another video to watch here of an example uh, of a bluff charge, but it's gonna take me out of the presentation to do it. So just bear with me for one second. I'm gonna pause it first right up beside us. And, and full screen here and then start it a little bit through. And this, you could turn the volume back down. This will be a little louder. Oh my God. Oh my. That's a bad idea. Okay, so I'm sure you saw what she did there. She just kind of hopped towards that guy, that very, that guy doing very bad behavior. You should, first of all, never be approaching a wild animal like that. Um, and she let him know, you're too close, I'm upset. And so she just kind of hopped towards him. And so that's more what a typical bluff charge looks like, um, rather than maybe the, the big scary roar or whatever uh, movies might have us imagine. So I think those are some really good examples if you're wondering what defensive behavior looks like. All right. So in defensive encounters, we're looking for the bear behavior. We're looking for huffing, jaw popping, salivating, slapping the ground, bluff charging. And we're thinking about the situation, the context that we're in. Are there cubs present? Do you have a dog? Is it off the leash? Is there food present um, that the bear wants to defend like a berry patch? Did you get too close to it, maybe accidentally? Or did you startle it by coming up a ridge um, and you're just too close? So if you can answer yes to any of these, all of these, you know, you're likely looking at a defensive encounter. And so there's very common defensive scenarios. And what I was originally going to do was kind of get some of the media stories, um, but decided you just don't have time, but you can look these up. These next two situations are very common. They happen multiple times a year. Um, so there's plenty examples, but we're just gonna give a general narrative here. So imagine you're at home, you live in kind of a rural area and you're about to go to bed. You wanna let your dog out to go pee one last time. So you go to the back door, the sliding door, you know, you let, you open it and you let your dog out You go back in and close it because you're going to let him in in a second. But as you turn around, you hear him barking. Um, so go and, and wildly. And so you go back outside, maybe you turn on the light and you call to your dog. At that moment, you notice that there's a bear that had been feeding on your bird seed and it is now charging you. The bear makes contact and attacks. Usually you can't see the cubs at night, but what is often the case that's found later when there's an investigation that the bear that attacks you is found to be a mother with cubs and she is euthanized. So the next common scenario is, imagine you're hiking, um, and this doesn't have to be in a, remote rural hiking trail. This could just be down your street if you live in the suburbs in bear country or on your favorite rail to trail 
a hike where you're just walking with your dog next to a road. But you like to have your dog off leash because it gives them some freedom. And you come up on a mother black bear with cubs. Usually the first thing that happens is your dog begins to bark and you call it back to you to try to get it under control. And the bear, rather than attacking the dog, cues on you and attacks you. I think it's interesting that the dog is often, in most cases, not attacked, but the attack is on the human and the attack is often severe. And even though I said these cases tend to be not fatal, they can be, and they have been, uh, including, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, a woman in Colorado, this situation happened to. Uh, and then the bear is almost always, always euthanized. So two situations to think about, to start thinking, how does this stuff happen? And with that, okay, so we know there's high risk scenarios. We know there's situations that we can get into that can increase our risk of encountering a bear and then being attacked. So are you, do you have a dog? Is it off leash? Have there been reports in the area of bears around and or feeding on garbage, bird seed, gardens, grills? Uh, do you see cubs? You might not always see them, but a lot of the times you can. Are you at risk of startling a bear? So maybe you are in an area with um, a lot of a, a bear food and not a lot of visibility. So it's just really thick and the bear might not be able to see you. All these situations we can, we can know before we even see a bear that we're in a higher risk and we can simply avoid them. One of the best things we can do to avoid this is just avoid the high risk scenarios. Some, we might not always be able to because of our work or where we live, but we, if we do what we can to avoid these high risk situations, we won't ever be in an attack situation to begin with. Okay, so some information about what the defensive encounters are, but the important part, what do we do? Let's bring it together. So again, we wanna remember the bear thinks you're a threat and we wanna demonstrate that we're not a threat. So we don't wanna be aggressive. We wanna stay still and talk to the animal in a calm voice. You can say anything really, but just, hey bear, I'm here. I'm gonna go away. And if the bear's not approaching you, you can slowly begin to back away. And if the bear still is not approaching you, and, and the bear is also maybe walking away now, then you can also walk away and leave the area. But if the animal is approaching, we don't wanna keep backing away. We wanna stand our ground, continue to, to, that, to make that calm talking voice, um, not doing anything to escalate the situation like yelling or running or throwing things. Um, and then at this point, we're gonna prepare the bear spray. So we've all got it on our hips, which is where it should be or somewhere we can reach it. We take it out of the holster, remove the safety and prepare to spray. If it charges, you might not be able to tell if it's a bluff charge or an actual charge. So this you know, can be tricky. So if it looks like it's gonna make contact, use your bear spray. That's what it's there for. And then if you are attacked, which should usually only happen if you forgot your bear spray or you can't get to your bear spray, that's when we are not gonna fight back. So there's that fallacy and we're gonna talk a little more about it. And then once the attack stops, we're also gonna remain on the ground still for a while. We're gonna wait till the bear is gone because often um, the person might try to stand up and the attack will happen again because, oh, you weren't a threat, now you're up again, okay. So stop here, do not fight back. You might, hopefully a lot of you know this already, but you might be saying, well, Janelle, I heard my whole life that if I'm attacked by a black bear, I'm supposed to fight back. So where did this start? This started 
based on those kind of generalities that I was talking about in the beginning. Um, before we had good information on defensive attacks by black bears, a lot of the times it was assumed that black bears only attacked um, in that predatory way that we talked about where it, where it usually results in the person's death. So it kind of came from this idea that um, we're gonna treat any bear like it's predatory. But we do know that black bears attack defensively almost 12 times a year in the lower 48, which is 20 times more than the predatory attacks. So they happen. And so we got to treat them differently. We also know from uh, victim testimony that people that have been attacked by bears, that when they engage in that and try to fight back during that attack, they realize that it's not helping. And then they switch behaviors and they play dead. And right when they play dead, the bear stops the attack. So we've heard this again and again. And then the research that I conducted showed that in certain situations, when people fought back in a defensive attack, the attack was more severe. So we have a lot of evidence that backs this up, that we're gonna respond to the behavior, not the species. Okay, so let's review the defensive encounters. We're gonna, first of all, try to avoid high-risk situations. And that encounter begins when the bear notices you and responds to your presence and sees you as a threat. That's defensive. Most of these defensive encounters are by female black bears with cubs and a lot of them involve a dog. So if this situation results in an attack, it's usually, but not always, not fatal to the human, but can be very severe. When we, when we uh, are encountering a defensive and bear, we wanna demonstrate that we're not a threat. We're gonna use bear spray if necessary. And then if we're attacked, that's when we're gonna be still or play dead, whatever you wanna call it, and stay down after the attack and wait for the bear to leave the area. Okay, non-defensive encounters checking the time here. We're good. So different situation here. We're talking about a different motivation by the bear. This time the bear's not seeing you as a threat. It actually wants something from you. It might want your food. It might want you as food. And then there are some other situations like habituation, being curious, or it's just moving around and you're in its way. Um, but these two is what we're gonna focus on because these are the two that often result in attacks. What we know about these encounters are that um, when they're fatal, it tends to be male black bears in remote locations that are acting as a predator. And when they're not fatal, they're often young male bears engaging in this food seeking behavior. In usually in the front country, they're usually food conditioned and habituated and they result in minor or no injuries. Okay, so we're gonna ask ourselves the same kind of questions. How do I know if it's not defensive? So again, all the things we know about past attacks. Do you have food that it's trying to get? Which this can be pretty obvious. You might have a cooler next to you and the bear you can see is trying to beeline right for your cooler. Or are you hiking? and the bear might be following you. Uh, is it intent and focused on you and approaching? Without those clear signs of defensive um, uh, agitation that I just showed you. So all the huffing, the popping, um, you're, not, you're not seeing any of that. Instead, it's just focused, its ears are up and it's walking at you. Um, there doesn't seem to probably be any cubs and it doesn't seem to be defending any food. So those are the questions we can ask ourselves um, to know it's not defensive. Okay. So it's really hard to get, we're gonna start with predatory. And it's really hard to get a predatory behavior on camera, but this is a good example of 
um, a bear that's moving directly at you, um, clearly not defensively, um, but this is, is not exactly predatory, but we're gonna start it and start a bit through so you can see kind of the height of the interaction. Get crazy. Hi. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Okay. So first off, there's there's a lot of things that this person, if they had some education, could have done better. Um but I I I want to focus on the, that bear's behavior. So it, it wasn't defensive. It was coming directly at her. Um, she likely could have scared it away. Um, and it, so this probably wasn't true predatory, but it was, it could have become that. So what we want to think about with predatory is the same kind of things. What are we going to ask ourselves? What are we, what are we going to look for? So the bear is intent and focused on you. It's approaching directly. It could be following, stalking, or circling you. Uh, in that video, it was following her. Usually these bears are not easy to scare off. Um, there have been several um, firsthand accounts of people fighting off these bears for a long time. And they're, if they decide that they want to use you as a food source, it seems that they're very determined to do so. And then again, you're not going to get any of those behaviors like huffing, jaw popping, or slapping, those defensive behaviors. And you can think about the context, see what's going on. You know, are you alone in remote area? Is the bear large or an adult? Uh, it's possible the bear could look in poor condition or health. And although this isn't proven, it's been said it's possible these encounters could happen more in bad food years or drought. So a common scenario for the predatory attack. You're out working in a remote area or wilderness. Um, you're miles probably from any town or services. You probably don't have cell phone service while you're working, and maybe that's doing a survey or working on natural resources lines or something like that, you hear noises behind you and see a bear about 50 yards away and it appears to be following you and approaching. You yell, you wave your arms, you clap, try to scare it and the bear just continues to approach, very direct. You reach for your bear spray and realize, oh no, I don't have it. The bear comes directly at you, begins circling you, looking intently at you, and then uh, overtakes you, attempting to use you as a food source. You fight, it does not leave, and in this situation, you most likely do not survive. So I titled this common predatory scenario, but keep in mind, predatory is not common. What did we say? That happened maybe once every other year in the lower 48 states and maybe twice a year in Canada and Alaska combined. 
So this is a common scenario, but the, the predatory act itself is not common. Okay. The next uh, behavior of the non-defensive we look at is the food seeking behavior. So that is when a bear is gonna try to obtain your food. So some lots of examples of this, unfortunately. And so we're just gonna watch a little video um, and I'm gonna actually mute it because um, there's a lot of screaming by the people, but you will see the behavior here. Go! Listen, if it comes running, Josh, get up Go! Here. Let the food burn. Go. Run! Call the police. Bears walking <laughs> intently, come on, directly. Dad. Go. Dad, come on. It can jump over there, guys. Woo. Absence oh. of any defense. Oh, it'll, it'll go. Go. I'm gonna get my gun. <laughs> go. Like, come on. Get go. The house, get in the house. Get the drink. Get to a food source. Get your stuff. Shrimp. Go. Get out of it. Go. Get, get hot. Get. Woo. Watch out. Watch out. Watch out. Woo. Right. Get. No. Get. Go. Get. 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 Get out of her! 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 Quit. Oh. <laughs> no. no, 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 no. So it goes on for a bit, but I, I really wanted you to see um, that uh, initial, that initial approach. So food seeking. What do we know about the food seeking? It's often uh, a curious or cautious approach by a bear. They're often young male bears that do this based on what we know of all the past incidents. It might initially look like predatory behavior, um, but they're often easy to scare off. So that bear also probably would have been easier to scare off if the person was a little more aggressive. But these categories also aren't static. This could turn into opportunistic predation as well. And um, luckily we handle the predatory and the food seeking behaviors the same way. We can also think about our situation. Uh, are we in the front country? Do we have food present? Is the bear small or appear young? And then very importantly, have there been reports of bears getting food in the area? This is almost always the case. And then also, um, it could be a bad natural food here that um, creates more of these cases. All right, common scenario here. This happens a lot, um, especially um, in, in camping related situations. So you're camping at a popular campsite. The campground host mentioned when you checked in that bears have been entering the campground and to make sure you secure all your food in bear boxes. And you really want to follow this, you know, you care about bears, but maybe at the end of the night you wanted a snack and you just forgot to put it back in the box. So now it's in the tent with you and you fall asleep. In the middle of the night, you wake up to pressure on your leg and something is clearly biting you through the tent. You scream, you get up, you get out of your tent in time to see a bear butt running away from you. So this scenario happens a lot, especially in popular areas where bears are very food conditioned. Um, these, if, if you look at the research, um, a, lot of, a lot have happened in Colorado and California. And again, this, this shows us what are the high risk situations. So are you alone in back country? Did you forget your bear spray or just not think bear spray is important? Are you camping or recreating in an area where there have been reports of bears getting food? And then the best thing we can do is avoid these situations. Don't get ourselves into these situations in the first place. And we can really reduce our chance of even having to do what we're talking about. And that's responding to a bear encounter. So how do we respond? 
All right. Luckily, the way we are going to respond to the non-defensive encounters are the same for predatory or food-seeking behavior. We remember that the primary motivation of the bear is that it wants something. It wants our food or possibly us as a meal. And so we have to be the dominant ones here. We are gonna stand our ground. We're not gonna move. We're not gonna back away. We're not gonna run. Instead, we might even take a step toward the bear and clap and yell and wave our arms and try to look big um, to be that dominant one. Then if that bear keeps approaching, you're preparing your bear spray. You're removing it from the holster, you're taking off the safety and you're getting ready to spray. If you don't have bear spray, that's when you're gonna look for other items. You're gonna look for rocks, sticks, anything that you can use um, should contact happen. We're gonna act aggressively in this situation. And if it keeps approaching, deploy the bear spray. If you don't have bear spray at this point, we can throw some rocks or do things like that. And then if the bear makes contact, that's where that old adage comes from. We're gonna fight back. So in a non-defensive encounter, we are going to fight back with our lives. With, it's for our lives with everything available, rocks, sticks, pocket knives, anything you got. These bears, as I said, particularly in the predatory cases are very hard to dissuade. Okay, so let's review. Non-defensive encounters. First thing we can do is avoid the high risk situations in the first place. Best thing we can do. We know that the encounter begins when the bear notices us and responds to our presence and decides it wants something from us. We know that most of these are by male bears and that um, if it's a predatory attack, it often results in a fatality. And if it's a food seeking attack, it often results in minor or no injuries. But the categories are not static and can change. When encountering a non-defensive bear, we wanna demonstrate that we're the dominant ones and use bear spray if necessary. Should the bear make contact, we're going to fight back with everything we have. Okay, and let's take a step back. I just, I know I covered a lot, but big picture here. Attacks are rare. It's rare, but they do happen. Black bears do attack people, um, and it can result in, in severe injuries and death. So black bears are not harmless and need to be respected. And our actions matter. That's the big, our actions, what we do matters. Before the encounter, during the encounter, during the attack, our actions matter. We're gonna react differently to defensive and non-defensive encounters, regardless of species. So here's the kicker, and I haven't even got to talk about this, is that everything I just said, even though I'm talking about black bears, applies to brown bear or grizzly as well. We respond to the behavior, not the species. And who noticed that there are two things in each situation that are the same. They are avoiding the high risk situations and carrying and using bear spray. If you take nothing else from this talk, please take those things. So you can use bear spray in any of those situations and it's going to 99% of the time stop the encounter. So if you can just remember that and to avoid the situations in the first place, that is great. <laughs> okay, and sometimes talking about what not to do um, is a little hard. So I like to leave people with the do. What should you do? Keep your dogs on a leash. Keep all food and items secure around your home and camp from bears. So any food, any scented items. Hike with more than one person. Camp in areas that don't have that recent history of bears getting food. Use motion lights at your home. So when you're letting your dog out at night, check the yard first. And then always, always carry bear spray, know how to use it and have it accessible. We're gonna play dead with defensive attacks. 
We're going to fight back with those non-defensive attacks. Okay, I want to just give you a couple of resources and then we're gonna stop for the questions. So good, good on time too. So a lot of that, that research I talked about was done by Dr. Steven Herrero. He has a, he literally wrote the book on black bear attacks called Bear Attacks, Their Causes and Avoidance. Um, a lot of the stuff on fatal attacks I just presented is from a paper um, that's called Fatal Attacks by American Black Bear on People. So all the things I just said are in there, check it out. Um, the information on the non-fatal attacks comes from my master's research. Uh, it's available um, public access called Characteristics of Non-Fatal Attacks by Black Bears. Also check it out. All those same statistics are going to be in there, as well as a lot more I just wasn't able to cover. And then uh, I always recommend this video because even though it's an older video, it's still one of the best videos we have around uh, for bear safety. And it's called Staying Safe in Bear Country. That's by uh, John Hechtel and Partners, and you can find it for free on YouTube. Um, it is, yeah, it was made in the 90s, but it still has all this same, same advice and just to show that we've known all this stuff for decades now. I want to thank Kim and Rec Safe with Wildlife and all of you for being here, everyone that helped with the research I did. Um, some of the photos were by Christy Morris and then uh, Dr. Herrero's research and John Hechtel's video that I mentioned. All right, so I hope I didn't talk too fast. I'm gonna stop sharing here and we can go to questions. <laughs> oh God, thank you so much. And you didn't talk too fast. It was actually amazing. I'm usually the one who's like, I'll get too excited and then it's like what did she say <laughs> so that was fantastic thank you Janelle all right Sarah what kind of I know there's a zillion questions I wish you luck in trying to figure out which ones to ask yeah there is a million questions but I feel like we should do the giveaway first just to get it out of the way and then people can leave if they want or they can stay for some questions okay mm -hmm. should we give away a scat belt first for yeah let's I've never seen these I was just showing this to Janelle I'm like you live in Washington State, you need bear spray holsters. So this awesome thing goes around your waist or across your chest. You can wear it when you're, you're hiking and you're running, you're walking your dog because it's easy just to put it over top of your clothes, over your jacket. You don't have to have a belt. Um, and I think this things like this, when we make it easy to carry bear spray, it can make a big difference for us. So um, we're definitely gonna give one of these away. Who won, Sarah? Yeah, so I picked random winners uh, for the prizes and the winner of the scat belt is Chris Vinay. So Chris, I will email you because I have your email because you signed up for the talk. So you don't need to worry about emailing me. I will email you. And then we are also gonna give away a bear safety course, right? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, and there's a two hour course um, on our Rec Safe with Wildlife website. And it definitely referenced Janelle's work. Uh, we have interviews with uh, Dr. Tom Smith and, and we definitely talk about some of Herrera's work and we, we show lots of videos of what these different behaviors look like in black bears and brown bears and, and helping people understand that it is situational and it is behavioral and it's not just, it's, it's not species specific. Ooh, wow, those <laughs> words. Um, so if, uh, if you do want to take the class, um, certainly we're going to give this away for free. And for those of you that are like, oh, I'd really love to take the class. Um, we're giving everyone, uh, 20% off the class and you just use the coupon black bear and it'll be sent to you in your email. Um, when we send out a thank you and a link to the video, since we, we recorded this as well. So great. Thanks. Go ahead, Sarah. Perfect. So the winner of the bear safety course is Nadine Mayer. Mir? <laughs> Nadine Mir. So I will also email you, Nadine. And as Kim said, um, we will be sending you a thank you email right after the talk. It's going to have 20% off the bear safety class. It's going to have a discount code for the scat belt. It's going to have the link to our YouTube channel, which has um, this, it's going to have this talk on it and other talks that we've recorded. And it's also gonna have the link to our website. So you'll have everything that you need in the thank you email. All I'll right. Just add a thank, I'll just yeah. add a thank you also to Scat Belt just because they donate every single time we have one of these classes. 
and um, we really appreciate it. And also, if you don't win tonight, then um, if you didn't win tonight, you can go on to their Scat Belt website and just use the word RecSafe and you get 15% off. And they take $5 of that and they donate it back to RecSafe so we can so we can help to pay for the website and the Zoom and everything so that we can keep doing the courses. So um, thank you so much for Scat Belt. And um, they also have a holster for your phone. So you can uh, you can video your death. I'm just joking. <laughs> Like, don't do videos, people. Stop, stop. <laughs> yeah, stop no video your bear encounters. Okay, let's get to some questions. Uh, obviously, we it's impossible to get to them all. I'm just picking ones that I think will be the most beneficial to everybody. So, Janelle, <laughs> um, one of the popular ones that was coming up was uh, information about using an air horn um, instead of bear spray, or I guess you could carry it with bear spray, but people are curious, when would you use an air horn and how effective is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. And I, I like air horns, but I would never say carry an air horn instead of bear spray. I think if you wanna carry an air horn, you should carry it with bear spray mm -hmm. because an air horn, horn does not work all the time and bear spray almost always works. So if you maybe are in an encounter, when, when you're in that encounter in that time where you're gonna yell and try to scare the bear away, that's when you could use the air horn. And then if it didn't work, you have your bear spray. So. Would you use an air horn in a defensive encounter? I would say no, because again, you want to be you want to show you're not a threat mm -hmm. um, and that kind of loud noise, it may not trigger anything. You know, these aren't absolutes, but I would, I would say that it's probably best to take that softer approach. Awesome. Thank you. Um, people also were curious about the effectiveness of bear bells and basically like, how is it different than just making noise with your voice, I guess, like how effective is making noise on the trail and do bear bells help you to avoid encounters? Yeah, this is a really common question. And unfortunately, bear bells don't have the volume They They just don't have it. They can't be heard unless they're you're right next to them. So unless you're right next to the bear and you're tingling your bear bells, it's not going to hear it. And so have your voice, voice is deep. It has all kinds of different tones and bass and inflection. So for clapping, I would say never, you never want the bear bells. Use your voice, use your hands. Um, they just, they're not loud enough. Okay. Um, okay, someone was curious about predatory and stalking behavior versus a bear just being curious and checking you out. Is that the same thing? And how should you react in each instance? Yeah, and that's tricky. And so that's kind of like the video I showed, right? Where it, it showed some predatory like behavior, but not quite. I, I would say always err on the side of caution because predatory behavior can be deadly. If you don't know, <laughs> and it's, and if it's, displaying any kind of non-defensive behavior toward you, 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 you know, you don't want to do um, what the person in the video did and just not try to scare it away at all. You want to take that, take those non-defensive steps that I outlined. You want to be the dominant one. You want to yell, clap, be big, try to scare it away because you don't know. It, and it can be hard to tell. So you're, you're going to treat them the same. Yeah. Perfect. Um, can defensive attacks turn predatory? So like if you were laying on the ground playing dead and then the bear starts to eat you, mm -hmm. what? You? <laughs> yeah, they can. They, they can. And I did not run across any cases like that in my research, but I have read about cases that people reported the bear seemed to change behavior. And so if it seems to change behavior and you're playing dead and the attack is still going on, 
you have to think is something else happening. Like, just like the people that were playing, that were fighting back, they realized it wasn't working. If you keep playing dead and it, and it's just not going away and could be taking bites, then yeah, try fighting back. It can happen, but it's not common. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is actually a really good question. And I have kind of always wondered this too. In the event that you have to use your bear spray, do you spray and run? I know in general you shouldn't run, but I haven't heard of what to do when after you use your bear spray. Oh yeah, that's a good question. Um, when you use your bear spray, the bear is going to be immediately reacting. It's probably going to be screaming and running itself. Um, but we never know how aware, you know, it's of its surroundings it is at that point. So we still say don't run because if it has any kind of wherewithal, the running still might trigger a chase. So just get out of there, but don't run. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, some people were, I guess, a little bit curious about um, what is the best way to keep yourself and your dog safe while you're hiking in bear country? Mm -hmm. So the best way is to keep it on a leash. Um, well, you could argue the best way is to not bring your dogs in bear country. There are people that recommend that. That is why certain national parks do not allow dogs. Mm -hmm. So you can think about an area, you can think about where you're going, it's history with bears and bear conflicts, what kind of bears there are, how often people come into contact with them. And maybe you make a decision just not to go there with your dog. But for sure, if you go into bear country with your dog, uh, being on a leash and a short leash. Mm -hmm. So avoid retractable leashes that are like 20 feet long that can go in and out. Um, one about a six, six foot or less, you know, um, solid leash. Um, other than that, you know, you could try to train your dog to come and be quiet and those kind of commands. And that would definitely help in an encounter if you could for sure have your dog come to you and not bark. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that's, that's really just not possible with a lot of dogs. So I think that's the best advice I could, I could give. Okay. Um, if you see fresh bear scat on the trail, should you leave or continue hiking? Good question. And it, unfortunately it depends. <laughs> so if you're in a really open area where you can see all around you, and there's no wind that might be masking your smell and nowhere that bears could be hiding, it's probably safe to continue. Um, but if, if that opposite is true, let's say you're near a stream and the stream is loud and there's all kinds of bushes and things that bears could be in um, as well as natural food. Um, I think the better decision is if you're seeing lots of fresh bear scat or fresh bear sign, um, to make a decision to leave the area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is actually a question that I have. <laughs> um, I just, I know that some national parks in the U S I don't know about Canada, but some in the U S do not allow bear spray. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, like yeah. why maybe, <laughs> or like yeah. what so there yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. And um, there are, there's one park in particular that does not allow bear spray. And it's because they're interpreting a law in the park as bear spray is a weapon. The law says visitors cannot carry weapons and they're interpreting bear spray as a weapon. However, that law exists in all the parks and other parks do not interpret that um, law as, as um, qualifying to bear spray. And so you know, it's, it's unfortunate. It's up to the park and maybe you would make a decision that um, 
you know, you're more cautious in that park or um, you're going to behave differently in that park or maybe, um, yeah, you could write the park, ask them about it. <laughs> Yeah, um, that was just, I heard like someone that used that as an argument because I know, so Yosemite is the park, right? That doesn't allow bear spray. Mm -hmm. um, and they only have black bears as far as I know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like someone was using that as an argument to say that black bears aren't dangerous because mm -hmm. you don't need bear spray for them. And obviously yeah. that's not true, but. Um, yeah, and that's unfortunate that that's the message it sends because it's not the truth. We know that bear spray works on black bears. We know that black bears attack people. Why and and can kill them? Why wouldn't you have it? Yeah, there is absolutely no evidence to say that um, to to support that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's just do maybe like a couple more. That was like the best one that I saw. Um, new to camping in Canada, is it fine to cook in your campsite if you're at a busy campground? So you're, okay, so you're in a front country developed campground where there's like a picnic table and a fire pit with a grill, that kind of thing. I think that's what she means. And so, yeah, you're, you're going to be cooking there because that's what it was designed to do. Um, and... I would ask though, when you're going to that campground, what's the history? Have there been bears in the campground? Um, have bears gotten food in the campground? And then if, if you're not actively using your food, if you're not cooking or eating, that food has to be away in your bear box or in another secured location. Um, and that's the best way to keep it away. But in those type of campgrounds that, you know, they are designed for cooking and eating right where you're sleeping, which is something we don't recommend for backcountry camping. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Last, last question. <laughs> uh, what is it about dogs that creates such a problem for bears? Oh gosh. Just one more question. Oh. <laughs> that's a hard one. I can't answer that. Um, we can speculate, but we don't have a, a definitive answer. Um, it's, you know, it's possible that it just sees the dog as a threat and it's reacting to that threat. It could be because of instinct based on how it evolved with wolves and other types of canids. Um, it could be um, that it has a history with dogs or maybe you're, you know, in a state where um, bears are hunted with dogs. Um, some people suggest that can have these reactions, but we don't know that. Again, that is a hypothesis. Um, but, you know, all we can do is speculate. I, I mean, so really the why, that is really hard to get at, but we do know they do react to dogs. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if you guys have any more questions, you can um, ask them on our Facebook page, or we also have um, a free membership with a community forum that you can ask your questions and get them answered. So I am sorry we couldn't get to them all, but we'll, we could be here all night asking questions. Oh, could we ever? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have one question before we leave, just because um, you know, when we talk about bears and bear attacks, it tends to really like make us feel like these things are going to happen all the time. And, and yes, we definitely want people to understand you can get attacked by these animals, but there's like hundreds of thousands of black bears all over North America. And, you know, they're not going around every day attacking and killing people. Um, and there's definitely a reason why Janelle um, does the work she does. So I wanted to ask you, Janelle, why do you love black bears so much? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I always have loved bears, grizzlies and uh, black bears. And uh, I just became fascinated with them when I was younger. The idea of this solitary, omnivorous tank kind of running around the woods, I was just fascinated I wanted to know what how could they sleep all winter how come they don't hang out together as much as other animals how come you know why can they eat so many different things and um, why do they you know I just really wanted to know they always fascinated me and um, they're curious and they're smart they 
can find a way to eat anything. <laughs> I mean, they can, they can be in an area, not know the food sources, and they will find what they can eat and what they can't eat. And if something is unavailable, let's say, okay, there was a bear in Shenandoah National Park that was hit by a car and it, it hurt its teeth. So it couldn't feed normally. So generally black bear do not um, use black walnuts. Most black bear go for acorns, but this black bear could not bite the acorns because of the damage to its mouth. So it learned how to forage solely on black walnuts and none of the other bears did it. So it had all the black walnuts it wanted and you could just go see her and she had several successful litters of cubs and she would just be cracking the walnuts with her back teeth. <laughs> um, and they're great. They're absolutely great, curious, intelligent animals. And yeah, I mean, that's why I do this. I just told you a bunch of scary stories about bears, but I absolutely love them. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Janelle, for your time. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Um, this has been just a wonderful evening and it's re it's recorded, I remembered, and uh, we'll get it posted right away and everyone will get uh, an email uh, follow up with thank yous and it'll have the link so you can you can check it out. So thank you again for your time and uh, hope to see you in Seattle one day. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good night, everyone. Take Thanks, care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>